Gente, mas o que eu encontrei no Yeah. Uh -huh, recorded. Okay. So what I found in, in Zoom settings for my class that actually default setting was record, shared screen, and gallery view. That means everybody's faces. Yes. And that was not for, for my class. So I changed it manually. That was default. So mm -hmm. I had to change it, you know, in the settings to record, shared screen, and active speaker. So then it records only one person at a time. Yes. Uh, rather than everybody in the audience. Uh, yeah. That that's generally better. Okay. But that's in Zoom settings on, on the website. You know, you have to go to the website. I uh, set it there. Well, I think since it looks like we've somehow lost Christina, um, we're going to go ahead. So let me, let me just, Christina, are you there? No. Okay. So let me introduce uh, uh, Mike Cates. Um, uh, I know Mike Cates for many years since he was a, a junior research fellow at uh, Trinity College, Cambridge. Um, uh, he uh, was for many years professor of natural philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and uh, since uh, 2015, uh, he stepped into the illustrious position of Caucasian professor of mathematics at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Mike is known for his work in uh, soft condensed matter physics, and we're really excited to hear about his current work today. He's worked in areas such as colloids, polymers, liquid crystals, and granular materials. Uh, and he has, in some sense, in the spirit of Bill Anderson, developed interesting mathematical models to capture the essence of these emergent systems. And so we're really excited about his talk today. Thank you and welcome, Mike, for coming to join us today. Uh, thank you very much. I hope people can hear me. Um, normally, I would welcome questions by way of interruption, particularly as I'm aware that this uh, topic is not necessarily familiar territory to many in the audience. I don't know if it'd be possible, if people have urgent questions, to put them in chat for peers to relay them to me. If, but if not, unfortunately, you just have to wait to the end. Uh, first, I just want to say how much I enjoyed the, the session just now on Phil Anderson. I only met him a small number of times. There's one anecdote which I, I maybe even, I, w I wasn't there for the whole thing, so maybe even someone said this, but um, on one of his uh, visits to Cambridge after he'd returned to Princeton, uh, I think it was, yeah, this, this is the story I was told anyway, that uh, Sam Edwards and Brian Joseph and Phil Anderson went to the Three Horseshoes pub in Maddingley for lunch. So that combination, two Nobel Prize winners and the Cavendish Professor of Physics, and they weren't allowed in because they weren't wearing ties. So. That's a remarkably British story. Um, anyway, I think they had lunch in the bar, but not in the restaurant. So anyway, I'm talking today about active matter, particularly the, uh, the issue of active phase separation. I'll say what that is in a minute. I want to acknowledge my, uh, acknowledge my collaborators here, uh, particularly for this talk, uh, Fernando Caballero, Elsie Chung, and Cesare Nardini, um, and various sources of funding at the bottom. Ah, oh, no. Come on. Having just learned to do this, I now, of course, fail to advance the slides. Let's just see. Oh, that worked. Okay, so um, now the uh, agenda is here. Uh, I'll tell you, say a bit about active colloidal particles uh, and uh, both living and dead. And I want to emphasize in uh, this talk the, the way we construct uh, field theory type descriptions. So these are quite familiar classical scalar field theories. And if you know what model B is, that's the type of theory I'm talking about. I will explain that later. Uh, in the absence of time reversal symmetry. And for this audience, I want to explain that uh, lack of time reversal symmetry is not about magnetism in these systems. It's about systems which are continuously uh, dissipating heat. It's it's the second law, uh, you have a system which is constantly uh, using up energy, for instance, swimming microorganisms or bacteria, which are whizzing around, they have a, a, an energy supply and they're using it up. So it's actually CPT symmetry breaking if you want to be formal about it. So I'll describe uh, some of these scalar continuum theories that we use for this, talk a little bit about phase coexistence. There's a particular angle there, which is to do with the behavior of, of, of droplets under conditions of phase equilibrium. Uh, where you can, in active systems, get this strange phenomenon, which I will talk a bit about, which is reverse Ostwald ripening. Uh, that leads to microphase separation. And towards the end of the talk, I want to talk about the quantification of entropy production, because that's this issue of time reversal 
uh, uh, being broken in a field theory and asking the question, how do you uh, quantify the extent to which uh, that symmetry is broken? And we do that through uh, the entropy production, which is a computable thing in the field theories I'll be talking about. So these are the types of system. Uh, the, you could imagine a, 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 a liquid, tank of liquid with say a bunch of swimming bacteria, um, which are moving around, they have self-propulsion, motile uh, organisms. So that's something which at a large scale may look a bit like Brownian motion, but it isn't, it's not thermal, it's, it's dissipative. Uh, in the last decade or so, people, uh, colloidal experimentalists have found ways to make uh, very clean systems that behave in a broadly similar way. These are these autophoretic colloids. So what you have here, uh, this drawing is a, is, is a colloidal particle, say one micron roughly. It has an asymmetric surface. For instance, the front, front of it could be coated with platinum, the back with gold, something like that. You put that in a bath of chemical fuel, like hydrogen peroxide, and it starts to self-propel. So these particles start swimming under their own speed. And there are, there are ways of controlling whether they swim or not with light. There are others where light is the fuel. Uh, so there's this whole industry and in the experimental colloid realm of self-propelled colloidal particles. So here are some of these particles. This is from uh, Paul Jacobs' group in NYU. Uh, these are controlled by light. So you see that while they're self-propelled, they undergo this uh, clustering. Uh, they're making these little crystallites. In my talk, I will be talking mainly about uh, phase separation between a, 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 a dilute phase, so these uh, individual particles here, which we call a vapor and a liquid. I won't talk about crystallization. But here you see if the, if the light is turned off, these become ordinary Brownian particles. So this is now thermal motion. This obeys uh, uh, time reversal symmetry and detail balance. If you turn the light back on, you switch back to this state with the phase separation. So this uh, uh, clustering or phase separation is caused by self-propulsion. And this uh, goes under the name of motility induced phase separation. Motility being the biologist's word for the ability to move autonomously uh, by using a fuel of some kind. So if we look at this at the microscopic level, and my talk will mostly about field theory, so this is just background. Uh, the, the simplest way of thinking about this is something called the active Brownian particle. So what we have here is a, is a, is a particle which has a fixed speed, but it, this speed uh, it's, it's, it is in a particular direction, which is in a, a fixed body axis. So think of that uh, autophoretic colloid, which has a front and a back. So it knows which way it's self-propelling, but that axis is itself diffusing. So it has angular diffusion. So if you imagine the path that that particle will tra trace out, it's a persistent Brownian motion. It looks like a semi-flexible random walk. Uh, speed V has a rotational diffusivity dr, uh, orientation unit vector u. And if you coarse grain that uh, or an n non-interacting active Brownian particles, you get a random walk or a set of random walks uh, with a certain diffusion constant, which involves this ratio written here, uh, the swim speed uh, squared times the uh, angular persistence time tau uh, divided by the dimension of space. So if you coarse grain that, it looks like Brownian motion. And if that was all that there was, that coarse draining would actually restore time reversal symmetry because Brownian motion has got time reversal symmetry in the in the sense that I uh, mean here. But in fact, as soon as you confront these particles with any kind of challenge, like interactions, uh, the time reversal symmetry is visibly gone. So uh, here's a movie, which I hope you can see, of a asymmetric cog uh, in, in a bath of bacteria. And you'll see that this cog is rotating continuously in the same direction. And this is to do with the uh, persistent motion of these uh, motile particles. Uh, essentially, you have a rectification which turns into a macroscopic motion of this object. And uh, the violation of time reversal symmetry in this movie is, I hope, self-explanatory. If I ran that backwards, it would be running in the opposite direction. So that's the interaction of particles with an obstacle or a, a rotatable obstacle. This is a set of uh, active Brownian particles which are interacting with each other by purely repulsive interactions. So in a, a thermal system, if you have uh, Brownian particles with purely repulsive interactions, then of course you get a uniform fluid. You don't get a phase separation like this one, 
uh, between a vapor and a liquid phase. Uh, and I'll have more to say about this type of movie uh, later on. But this, uh, as I mentioned, is, the, is this phenomenon of, of motility-induced phase separation. So um, before moving on to the field theory, just a bit of kind of mechanistics about where this comes from. Um, what you find with um, uh, self-propelled particles, which is also true of human beings when they're walking down a high street and looking in the shop window, if there's something interesting in a shop window, you'll find that there's a higher density of people at that point in the street than elsewhere. So in the absence of uh, detailed balance or thermal reversibility, there's a general tendency of particles to accumulate wherever they move more slowly. And thermal Brownian motion is the exception. Uh, because you know that in a thermal system, if you have a region of different diffusion constant, but the same temperature and the same potential, you do not get a buildup of particles because that would not be the Boltzmann distribution. The Boltzmann distribution says exponential minus V over KT. If V is constant, KT is constant, but the mobility is variable, you do not get accumulation. But in the more general case of motile particles, you do. And also uh, such particles in many cases, like when they have uh, collisions, so hardcore interactions, as I've just described, tend to move slowly where they accumulate, so where they're dense. So that you have a positive feedback group. And that's the basic physics behind this type of phase separation and is completely understood in simulation terms for these active Brownian particle ABP systems. If you look at experiments, the situation is more complicated because there are other interactions. I described these autophoretic colloids and there you don't have a hardcore repulsion between the particles. Each particle actually self-propels by setting up a gradient of reagents and products from the chemical reaction around it, and then other particles see that gradient and, and can be entrained by it. So there are, uh, uh, what we need is a more general description. And something this more general description should uh, hopefully explain is uh, this phenomenon called cluster phases, which is where instead of going to a complete separation, so like a, a, a liquid vapor or a solid vapor phase separation, you get partial separation into clumps of finite size. And here are some pictures. There are more spectacular pictures than this in the more recent literature, but these were the early ones. So if you look at the middle picture here, you see uh, these uh, finite clusters. If you watch the particles in those clusters, they leave and rejoin. So they're living in that sense. And uh, it looks like a mini phase separation. And you saw it also in the uh, movie I showed earlier on with bigger uh, clumps, that in many systems these clumps cease to grow at a certain scale. So that's the cluster phases and that's one of the targets for the kinds of theory that I'm going to talk about next. So what I want to do uh, now is tell you or remind you about uh, the way in a, a classical system, so a system of uh, diffusing particles, h bar equals zero. So think just of an ordinary room temperature liquid vapor transition, uh, or probably actually better a binary fluid transition. So a mixture of alcohol and water that's going to phase separate. Uh, what is the uh, way to talk about that theory in the most general uh, um, uh, condensed matter physics sense? So what we need is a scalar field which describes uh, a composition variable or a density, so this is phi, and it's conserved because we have a fixed total number of particles. So it's time rate of change, as you see in the top line here, is uh, the negative divergence of a current. And in, for instance, colloidal particles, which might have attractive interactions, uh, the current to a first approximation is some mobility uh, times the negative gradient of a chemical potential, mu, plus a noise. So this is where the thermal noise comes in. So this uh, what I'm writing down here is a Langevin equation for phi. It has a, th it's a thermally fluctuating scalar field whose basic uh, motion is this conserved diffusion. And written down there for the chemical potential is the one deriving from a square gradient theory, which I shall now expose. So in these equations first, lambda is a unit white noise. So that's Gaussian delta function correlated noise. Um, there's a mobility in front of the grad mu term, which I've set to one and the diffusion constant D in a thermal system is related to that by KT. And that mu is the uh, chemical potential you get from a, a, a square gradient theory, so a phi-4 theory, the thing that you do 
uh, that, you, that you look at in the Ising model if you want to do the renormalization group, for instance. So uh, that uh, chemical potential is uh, the, the gradient of a free energy functional, which involves a local piece, which is just this uh, quadratic potential on the right with two minima when A is negative. So that's the case when you get phase separation and it has a square gradient too. Um, so we know about the steady states of this system. Uh, you can construct them just knowing the local part of the free energy by basically doing a global minimization of the free energy. And uh, you, the result of that is the common tangent construction. So uh, the uh, system in the, in the region, if you try to plant the system in the region where uh, you're in this bump of F of phi, it will phase separate into, uh, in this case, coexisting uh, volumes with the two uh, phase densities there uh, uh, given by those two minima. And more generally, the, the, the equilibrium conditions are that the uh, chemical potentials in these two coexisting phases are the same. So mu one equals mu two. So that's df by d phi, because in the bulk phases that coexist, there are no gradients. And the other con condition, so that says that the green line has to uh, touch the red curve at, with the same slope at these two points. And the second thermodynamic condition is equality of the pressures, which says that, that the, the two intercepts are also the same. So this is the thermodynamic construction, which is kind of uh, uh, undergraduate physics for phase coexistence in a, uh, a scalar field. So that's all fine in a system with uh, a thermal equilibrium, a Boltzmann distribution, detailed balance, and in the context of these equations, time reversal symmetry in the dynamics. And by the way, if you're wondering where time reversal symmetry comes from, it comes from the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which is connecting the noise to the mobility. So uh, it's not that there's no uh, damping in the system, it's that the temperature exactly compensates the damping to give you the Boltzmann distribution. So um, what the first thing I want to tell you about, which uh, is several years old now, is what is the, the minimal way of ext extending this uh, dynamical description. So that was called model B. What's the minimal way of extending that to a system which is got these active particles instead of Brownian particles? And uh, the, the simplest way is actually written down here. We call this active model B. And it has an additional term. I put a hat on the chemical potential mu to say that this is no longer, uh, no longer has a free energy structure. So I can break time reversal symmetry by breaking the free energy structure. And uh, it may not be altogether obvious why uh, it's true that if you don't have a free energy, you don't have detailed balance and you don't have time reversal symmetry. But actually, uh, I will, if I have time, prove that later on when I calculate the entropy production for this theory. So anyway, that lambda term isn't anybody's functional derivative. So that's a way of constructing a theory which doesn't have a free energy, doesn't have a Boltzmann distribution, and this is the minimal extension of model B to uh, describe the case of active phase separation where I don't have time reversal symmetry. So um, let's see what that does. Well, interestingly, uh, the first thing that it does is it, it changes the, the rules for coexisting phases. So unsurprisingly, uh, in, the, in the middle part of this uh, free energy curve where the, the scalar field phi is around zero. So phi is a, is, the, is a density, but it's not literally a density of particles. It's, uh, you put a linear transform on it so that it's essentially minus one in the vapor and plus one in the liquid. This is the way you tend to, to do these things. Um, so what you find that that lambda term, even though it's only a gradient term, and so at first sight, if you start thinking about the, the bulk phases, you say, oh, well, the chemical potential's the same because there's no gradient contribution in the bulk phases, and there's likewise the pressure. So I could equate the, chem the chemical potentials and the pressures, and that would be unambiguous, given that the only term I've changed is a term in the gradients, but it would no longer give the correct answer for the phase coexistence. So to actually calculate the phase coexistence, what you do is you have to assume uh, a phi that depends on uh, X, so a one-dimensional interface. So imagine I have a flat interface between my two bulk phases. I require zero current, so that actually itself, it does say that this chemical potential like quantity mu hat has to be constant in space so that the chemical potentials are equal 
in the bulk phases. But when you solve for a zero current solution with uh, zero gradients at plus or minus infinity, you do not get the thermodynamic construction. You get a so-called uncommon tangent construction where the offset in what would have been the pressures of the two phases is proportional to this lambda term. So it's proportional to the coefficient of this term that breaks time reversal symmetry. So uh, I may come back to this a bit later, but actually what this actually means is that even within this scalar field theory, that funny new term, that lambda grad phi squared term in uh, living in the chemical potential equation is effectively uh, creating a pump that pushes stuff from one phase to the other phase uh, because this grad phi squared I mean field level is only non-zero near the interface. So near the interface, there's something about this term which is essentially pumping matter from one phase to the other. And so I'll come, to, come back to this a little bit later on. So this uh, a failure of the common tangent construction, so we call that anomalous phase coexistence, is, is definitely a thing for active particles. Uh, you can confirm it for this theory, you can confirm it uh, algebraically on models where I have particles that are swimming around with a speed that depends on the density. That's one of the ways of understanding uh, the motility induced phase separation that I told you about before. If you actually do the same thing for active Brownian particles with hard core collisions, you again have anomalous phase coexistence, but it's not quite this analysis route. What you find in that case, for technical reasons I don't want to go into, is that the chemical potentials are different, but the pressure's the same. So there are subtleties here, but in terms of the, of the uh, types of scalar field theory I'm talking about with active model B, it's quite clear what's happening uh, and the unusual role of this new uh, term that breaks time reversal in the dynamics. So that's uh, the equations again. So the blue part is the equilibrium part, the red part is new. It gives us at least one good thing, which is this shifted phase boundaries. It does not give us cluster phases uh, and a number of other things it doesn't give us. If you look at this equation, uh, the current is the gradient of something. So this will never give you uh, spatially circulating currents in steady state which is another thing that you can arrange in active systems. It's quite easy to arrange that, in fact. So there's definitely something missing from this equation. And it took us a year or two scratching our heads. And here it is. So what is uh, written down here then, so this is called active model B plus, has uh, all the terms that uh, definitely break detailed balance or time reversal. So there's two independent terms that do that. One is the lambda term in the chemical potential, which I've already described. The other term is this zeta term, uh, which sits directly in the current. It's not the gradient of anything, so that means the current can now have a curl. And also, the reason we didn't spot it in our first papers on this is that this bunch of funny gradients, which are the only other thing that you can construct with two grads, well, in, by the time you reach J, it's got three gradients and two fields. Um, that combination that I've written down there uh, vanishes in one dimension. And so this term only exists in more than one dimension. Mike, can I uh, ask a question? Yes, please. Yeah. So um, uh, are you writing down J on a kind of symmetry constraint basis, or is it something that you can derive from some action or uh, other approach to things? Well, so this is like a Landau Ginzburg expansion. And what I'm doing at the moment is basically just doing a Taylor series in gradients and fields. So I could, I see. So I could have a, an action there, which I put in some imaginary vector potential and differentiate it to get your J that you've got here. Uh, you'll see something very like that in a minute. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so think of this just as in you know, a kind of a Landau Ginzburg expansion, full frontal direct, and you ask, what terms can you get at each order in uh, gradients and fields? And at the same order of lambda is also this other term. Of course, I could go to higher order and life would get progressively more complicated. But as in Landau Ginzburg theory, one would tend to see what you get at each stage and stop when you're satisfied with the results. And why do you group those two terms together multiplied by zeta? The what, where does the one because, come from? Uh, well, that, that combination, I've chosen to write that in such a way that that whole thing, that square bracket, vanishes in 1D. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I just write our independent coefficients of those three terms there, 
-hmm. only two of them are linearly independent because the, the gradient of mu is is a bit like one of those two terms. So at that order, there are three independent terms. There are three terms of which two are independent. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. So a corollary of that is if I think of these uh, uh, calculations of, of phase coexistence between dense and dilute phases, is that this new term, this zeta term, actually has no effect at all for a flat interface. So it has no effect on bulk coexistence but we will see that it has interesting effects when I have curved interfaces and that's because in more than one dimension this object here uh, that multiplies zeta uh, actually well as I say it vanishes uh, in one dimension which means also that it vanishes when phi is a function of one variable only so that actually this object is a it, it comes away from zero only as I curve the interface and curved interfaces play a, a quite a big role in the kinetics of phase separation. So that's something that uh, will have effects. Okay, so but no effect on bulk coexistence, at least not at the level of, of any kind of mean field theory. Um, okay. So why am I showing you this now? Uh, this is something that happens in uh, active Brownian particles. This is a simulation of active Brownian particles. Uh, the yellow regions are dense the purple regions are the vapor. And this hasn't gone all the way to full phase coexistence, but one thing you hopefully could have seen in that movie uh, as it reaches a fairly late stage of phase separation is that you get these uh, voids, and you can see them in this picture now, these purple voids inside the dense liquid phase, which is yellow. And these voids have a certain life cycle. They are uh, generated in the middle and they pop out at the boundaries. <laughs> So that uh, life cycle of these little bubbles, once I reach a steady state, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, has, a, has a, 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 a manifest visual breakdown of time reversal symmetry. And it turns out that to see this, you do need this zeta term. So let's see what the next slide is. Yeah, so this is a, a simulation of active model B+. Plus, and this is a steady state now. So I have this big blob of fluid which happens to cross the periodic boundary conditions. Part of the uh, phase equilibrium I'm seeing is these uh, voids, these, these bubbles inside the fluid. And you could see there this life cycle where they're formed in the middle of this uh, blob of fluid and they progress to the outside. So later, if I get the chance, I will run that movie backwards, but it should already be clear to you that that uh, visual uh, uh, observation of the steady state is showing that this theory uh, is is violently not got time reversal symmetry in its kinetics. And it, the same is true in principle of uh, active model B without the zeta term, but it's, it doesn't have these bubbles and it is much harder to see. So this is the model again. Um, here is, uh, so that thing I'm now going to uh, call that J zeta. And let's see if we can get a little bit further with our understanding of this model. And the first comment here is that because of the conservation law, although this, this J zeta can have a curl, uh, that's invisible as far as phi dot is concerned, because I take the div of J phi dot. So there may be a curl in the current, but if I'm only interested in movies that show me a time dependent set of configurations, so a time dependent series of phi's of density profiles, the curl of J is invisible. So if I cross that out, then the remaining part of that current is the gradient of something, that's just Helmholtz decomposition, but uh, familiarly from electromagnetism, the thing that it's a gradient of is something like a Coulomb integral. So uh, I need to look at the divergence of this current, and in three dimensions the results are written down here. Uh, I need to do a, a one of our integral against div j, and then the gradient of that mu is the same as up to a curl as the, the j that I started from. And this is useful because we're used in, in thinking about phase equity, we're used to thinking about chemical potentials. We try to avoid thinking about currents. So uh, if, uh, given the form that I said for this funny j term, which is this combination of gradients that vanishes for any flat interfacial profile, what you find then is that uh, I have, it, this looks like this chemical potential, which is a scalar, looks like the Coulomb potential from a dipole density 
and the dipole density, these dipoles, if you think of it as an electrostatic problem, they live on the interface between phases and the density of them depends on the curvature of the interface. So I get a non-local uh, contribution to this uh, chemical potential like quantity, which depends on interfacial curvature. So this will have uh, significant effects on behavior. So as I've said then, this each sort of changes the way that the chemical potential relates to the curvature of an interface, if there is curvature of the interface, and that has dramatic consequences for se phase separation under conditions where the separation includes droplets of one phase in another, which is typically en route to phase separation. That's certainly what you have. Okay, so uh, I'm sparing you the gory details. If you do a, 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 a mean field phase diagram for this active model, so I'm looking at what the steady states are like, when do I have phase separation? I told you that the, uh, the active terms shift the phase boundaries. And what's plotted here is the mean field phase diagram. So that doesn't care about zeta. And in terms of my other parameter, lambda, I, if the phase boundaries shift with lambda um, left to right, that's shown by moving up the vertical axis here. The spinodals, which is the point where the curvature of the local part of the free energy changes sign. So that's the point of local instability in uh, uh, the kind of phase separation model B I'm talking about. Um, is unaffected by activity. So as long as I have flat interfaces, this is my phase diagram. So the, the, the kind of mean field phase diagram, which assumes coexisting phases with bulk, uh, with, with bulk phases and flat interfaces, doesn't care about zeta, and this is what I should see. And if zeta is absent, in other words, for the active model B with only the first term, only the lambda term, this is actually what I do see. So there are plenty of simulations numerically on this model with finite noise, but as long as the noise is not too much, I see this phase diagram as long as zeta equals zero. So I see the mean field predictions. But when I do add that second term, which messes about with the currents and messes about with the uh, giving me these non-local chemical potentials, I see something else, which is in this region of the phase diagram here. Uh, if I turn uh, zeta up to a positive value, what I get is a uh, an, a steady state that has finite bubbles in it. So I see uh, uh, in that region, I see a, a uniform liquid with little vapor droplets in it. And these vapor droplets fail to coarsen and fail to establish a bulk phase of vapor. So this is a kind of arrested phase separation. Here's, here's a movie of it. So that we call the bubble phase, unsurprisingly. And you actually saw that when I showed the previous movie, which had this big droplet of liquid with bubbles inside it, it was actually a big droplet of this phase in excess vapor. That's what you were, were seeing there. So uh, this is a, a, an interesting steady state and I'll say a little bit more about what's happening to those bubbles in there. Um, but if I move on, so there's just a snapshot of the bubble phase. So I'm now going to point out a symmetry of the model. Uh, which is this. So if I go back to my equations of motion and I change the sign of both of the active parameters and the field phi. So if I change the sign of phi, what that means is I re-identify the liquid phase as the vapor and vice versa. I'm just changing plus phi to minus phi. So if I change both activities and phi, actually the equation of motion are exactly the same. So this active model B plus, if I just choose different signs for the uh, zeta and lambda parameter, magically, uh, I've just switched the scale on there. So now the black regions are the dense regions and the vapor is uh, the orange color. So this is now cluster phase. So active model B for one set of parameters can give you a, a, a vapor phase with bubbles in it, so a bubble phase, and for differently chosen parameters can give me uh, something like the cluster phases that I was telling you earlier were reported uh, experimentally. Okay, so there's a phase diagram. So uh, the, the, the sequence of uh, states along the bottom is the one with the high value of this uh, zeta parameter. If I turn zeta off or just down enough, I see a regular uh, phase coexistence with just the bulk coexistences, which is the top four figures left to right. So the new phases are the, are the, are the middle two and the bottom. So how do we understand that? 
uh, let me say a few words about how we understand that. So, um, and, uh, where do these new phases come from? Well, so now I need to tell you, or uh, hopefully in some cases remind you about Oswald ripening, which is a phenomenon that happens in uh, alloys, metal, metallic alloys, as well as in binary liquids and uh, uh, vapors. Um, so at a curved interface, essentially reflecting the physics of Laplace pressure, uh, there's an uplift in the chemical potential. So in the neighborhood of, of the interface, the chemical potential at the surface of a droplet, and I'll talk about droplets rather than bubbles now, that's the conventional language, uh, near the surface of, uh, say, a liquid droplet in vapor, the chemical potential is raised by a factor that is proportional to the surface tension, has a D minus one in it, so that it knows about dimensions and uh, one over R, so it knows about curvature. And phi B is the binodal density, that doesn't matter here, that's order one. So you can calculate the current uh, flowing onto or off of a droplet. So this is the bottom, bottom right picture. So what you find then is that if you have a single droplet, uh, it's, it's capable of coexistence with a vapor, as long as the chemical potential of the vapor is raised above the equilibrium value that you'd have for bulk coexistence with a flat interface. Uh, so the more important aspect of this, though, is if you have many droplets, because then the ambient chemical potential, so the uh, conditions at far away from a given droplet are set by the mean size of droplets, not by anything else. So what that mean, then means is if you calculate the fluxes onto individual droplets, you can find their rate of growth. It's given by this uh, famous equation at the bottom. Um, and the key thing then, if I just plot this function, r dot against r, and this is the uh, uh, unpleasant capitalism of phase separation kinetics is that the large droplets always grow at the cost of the small ones. So this is very unfair. Uh, but what that means is that if you start with the kind of picture at the bottom right, you always end up with one macroscopic droplet, uh, which is then uh, effectively, if it's big enough, a flat interface and bulk phase coexistence. So this process of having chemical potential excess caused by curvature, which drives currents from small droplets to large, that's the physics of Ostwald ripening. And that's how a system that's undergoing model B type phase separation gets to its end point of complete phase separation. So I said that this funny active contribution to the chemical potential, this non-local bit, actually gives me a step in chemical potential across the interface. Uh, so here it is, I don't want to go into the details there. But the key thing is that gives me a discontinuity in the chemical potential. Um, and what matters is the chemical potential just outside the droplet because that's telling you the current that is flowing onto or off of it. So that acquires a piece which is written down here, which is also like one over R. So it looks like the interfacial tension piece, but it's proportional to zeta. And so if I have a big enough active zeta, uh, so I just have this parameter, which is just in the model as a parameter, and I take it large enough in one direction or the other, I can change the sign of the effect of the, of the apparent interfacial tension in this expression for mu i at the top. So it looks like an Ostwald problem, but under conditions of large activity, I can reverse the apparent interfacial tension. Notice the word apparent. I don't get large fluctuations in the interfaces. It's just to do with these spherical droplets and the, the current that flow between them. So it's not like having a negative tension in any mechanical sense, but it is for controlling the phase separation kinetics. Okay, so that's the, the way this term kicks in. And so that's my normal Ostwald ripening. Uh, if I change the sign of the, effectively the interfacial tension, I get this. So now I have a stable fixed point sitting there, which says that if I start with some arbitrary distribution of droplet sizes, they converge to the mean. They, they all converge, they, they, uh, stuff flows from uh, big to small until they're all the same size. So that's how you can understand the existence of these droplet or bubble phases in the active version of model B. Uh, so if I didn't have any noise, what I've just said would be exactly right. Any in initial distribution would just converge to 
a droplet size. Interestingly, that droplet size is set by the initial number of droplets and the initial total volume of droplets. So uh, it's interesting then that although in the forward, the conventional Ostwald process, the initial condition is forgotten. Um, in the end, I always go to con converge on complete phase separation. If I don't have noise in this active model B plus, uh, I have a permanent dependence on my initial conditions because the droplets just share themselves out uniformly and then stop. But of course, if there is noise, that's not all that's happening. If there's noise, this is back to the movie I showed you before. So what, if you look at these movies closely, what you see is that uh, these droplets come into coexistence. Uh, they sometimes just evaporate, but they often coalesce and they don't often split. So again, if you look closely at this dynamics here, uh, you would not see the same thing if I ran that movie backwards. There's a life cycle in there. So crudely, droplets form by, by nucleation of a new droplet, but they generally destroyed by coalescence. By destroyed, I mean they reduce in number. So I tend to go from nucleated droplets to big droplets by coalescence, but then the reverse Ostwald process pulls those big droplets back down towards the mean size. And then that three-way balance fixes the mean size, which ends up uh, numerically, you find that it the steady state mean size does not depend on the initial condition, but does depend on the noise level in the Langevin equation. So it depends on the temperature, if you want to think of that as temperature. Okay. So uh, if I uh, didn't want to show that slide, so I won't. Uh, so if I have uh, a, a few more minutes, is that all right, Piers? Okay, I'm assuming it's all right. Um, I want to say a little bit now about time reversal symmetry breaking as a thing and entropy production. So uh, we're not talking about magnetism, we're talking about the difference between systems which have time reversal symmetry, which is true for a thermal system, including Brownian colloidal suspension, for instance, in uh, steady equilibrium state. So that's the characteristic of thermal equilibrium. So in a, in, in a, a, a state en route to thermal equilibrium, for instance, by uh, the model B process, uh, the arrow of time is set by ds by dt positive, and once you reach it, ds by dt is zero. So that, and the, and the principle of detailed balance, which is basically the same uh, uh, statement, says that if I get a thermal system, I wait for it to reach equilibrium, I suddenly turn the movie around and run it backwards. Within that equilibrium domain, I cannot see the difference between the forward and the backward movement. So you have an arrow of time or arrow of overwhelming probability taking you to uh, a, an thermal equilibrium state where time reversal symmetry is restored, even if when you started, you know, because of the second law, en route, it was broken by the entropy production. So the difference, of course, in active systems is that there's entropy production in the steady state. So there's no reason for the time reversal symmetry to ever be restored. But it might still be, particularly if you coarse grain the system enough. So here's the active model B plus that I showed you before. That is the very movie I showed you before. And the, I have these uh, vapor droplets in this big liquid domain, which are popping out at the interface. And uh, to insult your intelligence, I show you the backward movie and anyone can see the difference. I get engulfment of vapor bubbles at the surface of the liquid. They go into the middle of it and they shrink to nothing. So uh, obviously there is uh, time reversal symmetry broken in steady state at the, the level of observation of that movie. Now, uh, stochastic thermodynamics, which is a field which has been around probably for a couple of decades now, um, is a, uh, the proper extension of the second law of thermodynamics to uh, a, a fully fluctuating description. It tells you uh, not only just that uh, on approach to equilibrium, the entropy production is positive, it tells you what it is. It tells you that the entropy production in a, tra in a trajectory or in, in an evolution of the system is directly related to, or the, yeah, the entropy change of the universe is directly related to the ratio of the forward and, prob and reverse probabilities of seeing that sequence. So if I think in terms of the movies, I can say, well, here's a forward movie, what's the probability that I see that? And here's the backwards ones and what's the probability that I see that. So I take the log of that ratio and I get the entropy production. So this uh, statement, which obviously has its roots in thermodynamics, 
for our purposes, we can think of it as a, it's just an abstract theoretical construct. So I'm not interested in heat flow now. I'm just saying, how irreversible is my theory? And this is the way to answer that question. So the first comment is that the entropy production, and I'm talking about the steady state one now, uh, can depend on the scale of observation. I'll say a little bit about, more about that in a second. So uh, the very fact is, of course, that in going from, say, a particle theory to a field theory, uh, I have already coarse grain. So when I calculate the entropy production for field theory, it's not that I'm attempting to capture all of the microscopic irreversibility in the particle dynamics. What I'm trying to do is quantify the, the uh, irreversibility as you can see it in the fluctuating fields that I'm actually watching. And then the good thing about this, if you think, look at the, that log of that ratio, those path probabilities, because I have a Langevin equation in my uh, model B or active model B, uh, I can calculate that thing from the path integral. Here it goes. So the top line here is an equation for the current, which is the, the excuse this rather poorly defined inverse Nadler operator on the, the, in, on the left. But uh, the fact is that I can, because, it, because the current determines the dynamics of phi, I can calculate uh, uh, the probability of a space-time trajectory for phi of R and T. And I can calculate its time reversal and I can take the log of the ratio. And I end up with this thing at the bottom here is that the steady state entropy production in a scalar field theory like this is this object which involves the, uh, the ensemble average of the time derivative of the field uh, times the non-equilibrium bit of the chemical potential, which can include the zeta and the lambda terms, but I'll only talk about the lambda part now. So that's interesting because it says that the global entropy production is actually the integral of an operator in the field theory. There's the operator. So it's got a phi dot in it, but if I look carefully at what my noise is doing, I can replace this by this object here, which just involves fields and gradients. Um, and so that is interesting too, because actually I don't need to do any dynamics now. If I know the stationary measure, in other words, if I know the probability distribution for phi as the equivalent of the Boltzmann distribution, it's not a Boltzmann distribution, but the just that steady state probability for phi, then because I knew what the dynamics was, I can in principle calculate the steady state entry production for this theory. Mike? Uh, yes. Uh, Julio Larea has uh, a question. Does such a process of time reversal symmetry breaking lead to a first or second order phase condition once phase separation occurs? Or is it not possible to say anything about it? Um, the, 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 the phase separation in, separation in the models I've been talking about, uh, in those senses, are qualitatively the same as for equilibrium. In other words, you have a liquid vapor binodal, which is first order, except at the very top, there's a critical point, which is second order. So in that sense, the topology of the phase diagram for bulk phase separation is the same as a standard liquid vapor transition. Uh, if you have these uh, steady states that have droplets, then the transitions between a, a what we call a microphase separated state, so a state of droplets or bubbles, and the adjacent bulk phase is also similar to the same phenomena in equilibrium. So um, that can be first or second order, depending on the circumstances. OK. Shall I just carry on? Yeah, yes, please carry on. OK. So first, first thing then is that, um, at least at the level of numerics, I mean, it's very simple to evaluate that object as a function of position for a phase separated system. So uh, the, on the left is a cartoon of a liquid vapor coexistence in active model B with just the lambda term. I do that with the noise. I calculate those averages. And uh, interestingly, there's two contributions to this entry production. There's a big peak at the interface, which does not vanish when I turn off the noise. So there's a, a piece of entropy production, there's a piece of, you know, strong irreversibility at the interface between phases, which even in the limit of infinitesimal noise stays finite. And that connects with what I was saying before about having the, the field, this field theory has somehow managed to create a pump across this interface. It is shifting stuff up the chemical potential gradient or in, in, it's, it's doing something which the equilibrium system then has to flow back down, if you see what I mean. So there's, that's where the focus of irreversibility lies at the interfaces in the low temperature limit, D being diffusion constant proportional to T. 
Uh, but if you look, there's also a bulk contribution which vanishes as the noise goes down. So there's a bulk contribution proportional to the noise temperature and there's an interfacial contribution which scales independent of it. So in the very last uh, minutes of my talk, I want to just talk a little bit about the idea of uh, applying the renormalization group to this entry production object. And that contains with it the idea that you could have a system which is active uh, and therefore has uh, entropy production. Uh, but you could imagine that if I look at this at some very large scale, I couldn't tell the difference between that and a passive system. And in particular for active model uh, uh, B without the zeta term, but close to this liquid vapor critical point, it's actually very easy to show that that lambda term is irrelevant for renormalization group. So your first instinct upon writing down model B and adding a term which is irrelevant near the critical point is to say, okay, so I can remove that term at the critical point and I have a good description, but that description without lambda has got time reversal symmetry. So the question is, active model B does not have time reversal symmetry. Is it recovered somehow at the liquid vapor critical point? And just to jump ahead, the answer will actually be no. So anyway, the idea behind this is that depending on if I've got active particles, I zoom in on a particle and I see something like a wildebeest or a colloid, you can tell from the individual local behavior that it's active. If I zoom out far enough, it just looks like particles. So certainly the entropy production is going to go down as I coarse grain. The question is how fast does it go down and does it become negligible in a, a realistic sense? So I won't show that. Uh, that was a movie of some wildebeest, but I don't have none of that. So, uh, so this is a, 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 the next two or three slides and then I'll really will finish a, a bit abstract, but they're just, the idea of this is that the general expectation that certainly we started from is if I start, in, so I start, at, I'm talking about an RG structure here, a flow structure. I start at the green dot point one uh, at a, with a system like, like model B, which has time reversal symmetry, and I then break that. So it could certainly take me to a different critical point. It could certainly change universality class, uh, or it could leave it unchanged. Uh, and by the way, if I'm talking about entropy production, if I have a, a system like this, which is a fluctuating field theory, so think of the Ising model, kinetic Ising model, there is a natural scale for entropy production, which is one degree of freedom, so one block spin, flips every correlation time. That gives you uh, a, a, a natural scaling for entropy production. If those flips are reversible, then I see nothing. If they're irreversible, I should expect possibly to see something of that order. So, uh, okay, so I add the um, uh, activity. It could be relevant, it could be irrelevant. I do some RG. So uh, I could flow to a point over here, uh, <coughs> which is clearly active. The entropy production is finite in natural units, but normally you think, okay, this is an active model now. So you'd expect that other things would change. Like it'd be in a different universality class from basically the kinetic Ising model, which is what the passive version of this is. Or you could imagine uh, that you end up over there, going back, so you, you, you leave your initial critical point, but you go to another one, which is also passive. That's also perfectly possible because I, in principle, I might have strong coupling. I add these terms. I don't know where I'm going to add up. Uh, but uh, actually something else happens and I'll explain that in a second. First comment I've made already. So if I look at this in D greater than four, so this is the place where Ising-like theory is easy. This lambda is irrelevant. It's irrelevant in all dimensions above two, but it's certainly irrelevant near the Gaussian model. In, in, in more than four dimensions. And it turns out it has quite a simple expression there. I told you I can compute it from the stationary measure. Because lambda is irrelevant, the stationary measure converges to that of the Gaussian model without lambda, but the entropy production, which I compute from the average of this horrible composite operator here, stays finite in the sense that it stays order one per space-time correlation volume. So that's interesting. It says that, okay, for all practical purposes near the Gaussian uh, 
uh, fixed point, this looks like an equilibrium model until I look at the entropy production, and then it's finer. Um, so we call that stealth time reversal symmetry breaking. So near the critical point, I end up with a finite entropy production, but everything else seems to be the same as the passive model. So there's an obvious question, which what ha is what happens in less than four dimensions. Uh, there is a technical obstacle to this. Uh, this operator that I've told you about has a lot of gradients in it and a lot of fields. It's very irrelevant. But when you look at the flow of irrelevant operators in RG, you find that you need to treat all operators of the same order together. And unfortunately for active model B, although we're only interested in one of these, which is the entropy production operator, there are 20 operators with that number of gradients and phi's. So you have to do a 20 by 20 matrix renormalization group, and that's longer than a PhD thesis. So what we did with that is drop the conservation law. So that then gives me an active version of model A, so-called, which is uh, uh, spin flip dynamics rather than conserved spin dynamics. I still have broken time reversal symmetry. I've now got seven by seven and uh, uh, Fernando Caballero, in a kind of heroic effort, uh, did complete this calculation and it's in this reference here. So what you find then is that that model without the conservation law also has this same behavior of finite entropy production above four dimensions and bizarrely divergent below. So the entropy production is bigger than one uh, of order one per spin flip or in a one per coarse grain degree of freedom per coarse grain correlation time, which says that there's entropy reduction probably on all scales below the correlation length. So we're still understanding what this means, but entropy reduction is there as the, as the quantification of irreversibility in field theories. It's calculable, at least in some cases and under some conditions, it has interesting renormalization group behavior. So I realize I've covered a lot of ground and I hope at least parts of that were uh, comprehensible and interesting to at least parts of the audience. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mike. Let's unmute our, our uh, speakers and thank Mike for a great talk. And then we'll go to questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, okay, now we're into question time and I invite you to raise your hands uh, if you have a question. Let, let me start, actually, uh, Mike. It uh, went by very fast, but how do you keep track of the, of the uh, entropy or the heat or the energy production in this, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, sets of equations that you put forward as model B? Yeah, so the, the key thing then was, was this... Um, I will go back to it because it's quite an important thing. So that is the key thing. So the point is that uh, if you have, and then this, this has the same physics, if you know the fluctuations theorems, the things like Jarzinski's inequality and uh, uh, there's, there's a number of others. What they basically, they're normally written the other way down, the other way around. They basically say, um, if I see something happen and I want to know how likely it is to see the time reversal of it, all I need to know is the entropy change between the initial and final state to take the exponential and that's the ratio of those two probabilities. So this equation here is essentially just the inversion of that. It's saying that in, it, certainly this is true for any system that does have a, a, an equilibrium and heat flow interpretation. It says that uh, the probability of the forward and backward path differ in a way that reveals the entropy production. But granted this equation, how do you calculate the probability of the forward and backward sequences from your scalar field theory? So I have, okay, so if I take uh, div of the top equation, I've got phi dot is minus div j, there's a minus sign missing. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the, and the, the current is the gradient of this chemical potential, which includes the non-equilibrium part that I described. Mm -hmm. So that's, and it's got the noise there in the current, as you can see in the top line. So that's a Langevin equation. So I know the statistics of lambda. So if I take that, uh, this piece here over onto the left, then uh, 
that thing is, is, is Gaussian distributed. And that's what this next line says. It says that P is the exponential of this thing. This object here is a property of the path. So basically, I, the, what the equation of motion does, it tells me how to turn the noise into a trajectory. And so if I know the weight for the noise, I know the weight for the trajectory in the dynamics. That's very cunning. Thank you. That's it, uh, and if you expand that square, what happens in between the forward and the backward path is that the only thing that changes is the sign of this term. Mm. And so all I'm left with is four times the cross term between phi dot or this inverse nabla on phi dot and nabla mu. And then those nablas cancel off by integration by parts. I'm left with this thing. Okay. Very nice. Okay. There are some other questions. Victor Yakovenko has a question. Victor, if you unmute your... Mike. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have this question. So roughly speaking, you started with equations of motion, so to say, and then you derived entropy production formula. Uh, can you do it the other way around? That is, postulate some form for entropy production and then derive equations of motion by maximal, you know, maximal entropy production or something like this. Uh, because you said the, the notion of free energy is kind of not applicable because it's not, not an equilibrium. But, um, but, you know, there is this idea of maximal entropy production. So can you postulate entropy, fun well, entropy production function and then maximize entropy production and obtain equations of motion in this way, in kind of doing it in the reverse direction? Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. But I think, you see, if you look at the form of this, uh, there's a lot of information being lost here. Yeah. Sure. So uh, because basically only these cross terms in, the, in, the, in, the, in those pathways matter. So I don't mm -hmm. think there's any way of uniquely reconstructing a theory from knowing this about the entropy production, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and so so there, may, there, may, there may be some other principle, like some, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bayesian principle, which would say, well, this is the least informative theory that gives you that structure. But I've not thought about that, and it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. So basically, at this level, the just uh, principle of maximum entropy production by itself would not be sufficient. You know, it's not doesn't have enough information to to you know, to have the full description, basically. Uh, that's, that's certainly true. And I'm not even sure that there is such a principle for this type of theory. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, I was wondering yeah. if there is. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pray, Pray me has a question. Yes. Uh, hi, Mike. I enjoyed your talk very much. Are there any observable consequences for experiments on active matter from your approach? Well, so um, there's lots of observations uh, of active particle systems particularly in this, collo uh, this uh, self-propelled colloid domain. And so, for instance, among these, you do see these microphase separations. You do, I mean, what, what I, I, one of the movies I showed you was that in the active Brownian systems, you see these voids inside uh, mm -hmm. the dense phase. And uh, there are at least some experimental <laughs> systems, which obviously are not exactly the same dynamics as active Brownian, where strange phenomena like that are seen, and certainly ones where this arrest of, phase separation in, uh, at a finite length scale is seen. So, uh, you know, obviously these, the kind of theory I've talked about, what I didn't talk about at all was a separate set of attempts of explicitly constructing theories like this by coarse graining more microscopic pictures. But I think the strength of this approach is that it at least tells you that certain things are going to be generic and so that you shouldn't be surprised when you see them. Uh, in other words, something where you would not see it in, in uh, a passive system, you do see it in the active one. So I think the connection with experiments is more there than with any attempt to predictively model uh, outcomes for specific experiments, because we don't have enough control of the coarse graining to say uh, this microscopic dynamics translates into these parameters of the model, okay, or indeed uh, whether the model is really like this or not. Thank you. I should say, by the way, as I, you know, that we do have models of this which are not based on the five four theory, but you know have row log row free energies, more like a liquid state theory. One of the things we learned, though, is say when we were looking at this reverse Ostwald regime, if the if the structure of the model isn't the simplest you can make it, it's almost impossible to calculate anything. So, for instance, that that way of of, of constructing the uh, getting from the funny chemical potential to the growth rates of droplets. I mean, this we did really did need the simplest model we could have to be able to get to the end of those calculations. 
and as a follow-up, in your last slide, you mentioned that you studied the, um, the, the simpler model, and then you had the intuition that the more complicated one, the 20 by 20 one with the 20, yes. uh, would ha behave similarly. I didn't quite understand the, where the intuition <clears throat> came from. Yes. Well, it basically just comes from the structure of the RG as it is. So you have this, uh, what happens when you look at, and I, this is something I didn't know, by the way, before uh, Fernando did these calculations. Uh, if you look at the scaling of irrelevant operators in RG, you get these, these basically uh, set of eigen operators, which are, are some linear combination of all the operators of a given order. Mm -hmm. And you can, uh, what you, the, the, the leading divergence of some observable depends on its projecting, projection onto the uh, eigen operator with the least irrelevant exponent. So with the, with the, which vanishes most slowly as you approach the critical point. And there are certain aspects of that that you can see in the structure of the equations for the 20 by 20 system, but then you can't actually calculate the exponents in the epsilon expansion. So you sort of know it looks similar, but you can't really get the answers out. So that's where we were with that. Okay, thank you. Good. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? Okay. All right, if there are no other questions, then let's, uh, let's thank Mike one last time for this fantastic and very clear talk. It was great. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Good. Well, um, everyone, this ends uh, today's uh, uh, activities of the ICAM Summit. And tomorrow, um, the science sessions will resume at uh, 10.30 in the morning, Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, there will also be, for those in, on the, in the ICAM uh, Science Steering Committees, uh, we will be starting our general meeting at the early hour of 9 a.m., Eastern Daylight Time. This is a killer for those on the West Coast. I apologize for that, but it allows people on, uh, in Asia to also participate in the meeting. So I look forward to seeing you all at the science sections tomorrow and also those of you who are coming to the ICAM general meeting. And thank you very much. And once again, thanks to Mike and all the other speakers today. It was a very interesting meeting.